Hi folks, welcome to this video on muscle fibre types. So what we're going to look at now is how your muscle fibres are actually made up, how your muscles, sorry, are made up of different fibres that allow us to do different activities and participate in different sports such as we have here. Now for those of you that watch the video on um, motor units and muscular contractions, we said there that how do you vary the strength of a contraction and there are two key ways. One, you could recruit a higher number of motor units for strong contractions or a lower number for weak contractions and we also said that the size of the motor unit how many muscle fibers were attached at one end is it thousands or is it hundreds or is it ten the larger the motor unit the stronger the contraction the uh, smaller the motor unit the weaker the contraction well there's also another way a third way and that's to do with the muscle fiber type how strong a contraction is dependent on is dependent on which muscle fiber type you recruit and there are three that we're going to look at so basically your muscles your skeletal muscles your gastrocnemius your pecs whatever it is are comprised of a combination of type 1 or slow twitch muscle fibers type 2a fast oxidative glycolytic sometimes abbreviated to fog f o g fog fibers or type 2b aka there should be a slash in now i apologize fast glycolytic or FG fibers. So basically every muscle in your body is a combination of these three kinds of muscle fibers. What we're going to look at now is what are the characteristics of each fiber type and which events are they most suited to. Right, so we're trying to cover all bases with all these different names. So just to quickly recap, we've got type one, which are slow twitch, also known as slow oxidative or SO fibers. Type 2A, fast oxidative glycolytic, and type 2B, fast glycolytic. And as you can see, I've tried to include a picture of each of the events where these muscle fibers will be dominant. So when we get the characteristics of these fibers, you'll be able to see how they link in with the event that we're talking about. So let's start with type 1 uh, or slow twitch or slow oxidative fibers. We've covered all bases by saying that. Um, where does it link in with uh, muscle fibre types? In terms of slow twitch or type 1 muscle fibres, they have a small neuron size, i.e. there are few muscle fibres in this motor unit. So like I said to you at the start, when we looked at varying the strength of a contraction and we looked at the number of motor units and the size of the motor units, these are small motor units. So how else can we vary the strength of a contraction? By recruiting or switching on type 1 or slow oxidative or slow twitch muscle fibers because they as a result of their few muscle fibers they produce low levels of force they also have as you'd expect slow contraction speeds hence why they're called slow oxidative so you might be thinking well what use are these muscle fibers well these muscle fibers are red in color indicating the presence of a high number of capillaries so they've got a very good blood supply and therefore a very good oxygen supply Hence why they are slow oxidative. They make high use of oxygen. There's a couple of other terms that you might be familiar with, might not be familiar with. Myoglobin. Myoglobin is a cousin of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin are your red blood cells. They carry oxygen in the blood. Myoglobin carries or stores oxygen in the muscles. So not only can we deliver lots of oxygen to slow twitch muscle fibers, we can also store lots of oxygen in slow twitch muscle fibers so these are endurance based muscle fibers they also have high numbers of mitochondria mitochondria are the power stations of cells they are tiny structures that help us produce lots of energy aerobically so mitochondria is an aerobic oxygen based energy producer and there are thousands probably millions of mitochondria in your slow twitch muscle fibers inside your body as a result they are very resistant to fatigue hence why this guy uses them okay yes they may only have a few muscle fibers yes they may have low force production yes they may have slow contraction speeds but they can work in Mo Farah and with other endurance athletes for very long periods of time and as a result of the mitochondria the power stations they can also produce lots of energy for long periods of time Hence why they are ideally suited to endurance events, marathons, Tour de France, triathlons, things like that. So that's how the structure of a muscle fibre 
and and uh, motor units, uh, you, you know, can be affect or affect your performance in various sports. So as a comparison, then type two A or fast oxidative glycolytic or fog fibers, you're going to see differences, but you know we're going to look at the key terms again. Now I've put a picture of Christina Hurugu doing the 400 meters here. Equally, an 800 meter runner uses a high number of fog fast oxidative glycolytic muscle fibers. Now, as you can see by the build of Christina Hurugu versus the build of Mo Farah, she has a lot more fog fibers compared to Mo Farah. And because she, the reason she's bigger is because fog type 2A fibers have large neurons, and i.e. many muscle fibers attached to each motor unit. So again, if I recruit a type 2A motor unit, I will automatically produce a stronger contraction than if I than if I send an impulse down a type one motor unit because there are more muscle fibers attached to a type two A motor unit or at the end of a type two A motor unit than there is a type one. However, there's still an element of oxidative in here. Okay, fog fibers. They have quite a few capillaries still. However, nowhere near as much as a slow twitch, and they are pale pink in colour, showing that there is the presence of capillaries delivering oxygen but not as much as a slow twitch muscle fibers. There are also moderate levels of mitochondria and myoglobin. So there is still a slight aerobic uh, element to these muscle fibers, but it's not that great. These muscle fibers, as you'd expect with the fast, have very fast speeds of contraction, high force production, and they have a moderate resistance to fatigue, hence why they are great. The classic term here is, they are great for speed endurance. Where you've got to sprint for, or you know, keep a high pace for long distances, for like relative, well, middle distances, four and 800 meters, things like that. So they're your typical type 2A uh, events. And these are, this is what characterizes a type 2A muscle fiber. Finally then, we've got type 2B, also known as fast glycolytic or FG fibres. These are the most explosive muscle fibres, hence why we've got a picture of Valerie Adams doing the shot put here. Again, similarities to the type 2A, because they're both fast, large neuron size, many muscle fibres. These fibres have a very low capillary density, virtually no blood supply. They appear pretty much white in colour as a result. They have very low levels of mitochondria and myoglobin. You know, these are not for endurance events at all. They have very fast speeds of contraction, very high force production due to the many muscle fibers attached to the neuron, so the large motor units. And as a result, they have a very low resistance to fatigue. They cannot resist fatigue. They tire very quickly. But the trade-off is you get much higher levels of force production. So, you know, we've got these muscle fibers. We, you haven't got necessarily muscle in you that is pure type one or pure type two or pure type two B. Our muscle fibers are a combination of these, but there is, an, there is a certain level of genetic advantage. For example, you cannot change type one into type two A or type two B. It's biologically impossible. Equally, you can't turn two Bs and two As into type one. You can turn two A's into two B's and vice versa through training. Hence why Usain Bolt, who would use type two B's for the 100 metres, was at one point potentially going to go into the 400 metres, which would need these type of muscle fibres. You can turn two B's into two A's and two A's into two B's by varying your training, but you can't change type one for type either type of type two or vice versa. So you were born either to be an endurance machine or a speed machine or a 50-50 split of the two. So genetics plays a part in that. Mo Farah was born with a high percentage of type one muscle fibers. However, he still had to train very, very hard in order to develop them and improve them. Usain Bolt was born with a high percentage of type two A's and type two B's. He's again had to train to improve them to the highest standard he can, but there is a genetic component involved. Right, the final thing on this topic is uh, what we call work relief ratios and recovery rates. So if you're going to train and you're trying to develop or you know you've got a certain type of muscle fibre, what's the ideal work to rest ratio or work to relief ratio that you've got? How much rest should you give each muscle fibre when you've used it? So let's have a look at that. 
So let's say you're developing your type 1 slow twitch muscle fibres. Remember, the key characteristics are they produce low levels of force and speed, but they are very resistant to fatigue. As a result, your work to rest or work to relief ratio can be 1 to 1 or 1 to 0.5. So you can, 1 to 1 would be do a 3 minute run and then give yourself a rest of 3 minutes, the same work period for rest period. Or because they produce low force and speed and because they are resistant to fatigue, you might only give yourself 0.5 rest. So again, if I run for three minutes, I give myself half the time to recover, i.e. 90 seconds. The reason is muscle fibre damage is not associated with endurance training. So if you go for lots of you know, low-intensity runs, you're not causing damage to the muscle fibres like you do when you work in high-intensity. So your rest, relief, recovery, whatever you want to call it, can be a lot shorter. So, you know, typically, if you were doing an endurance training program, you might do what we've done, what we've said here, three minutes rest with, sorry, three minutes run with three minutes rest and repeat that 10 times over the course of an hour, something like that. So it's, it's quite easy to do that and there won't be lasting damage to the muscle fibre so you can get away with minimal recovery. Now, fortunately, we can just deal with both type twos together. So we don't have to look at type two A and type two B differently. Because what categorizes a type 2 in terms of recovery rate is type 2s are high force levels, fast contraction speeds, um, and sorry, that should say lower resistance to fatigue. Let me just quickly change That's better, lower resistance to fatigue. So these fibers work harder, but they can't work as long. As a result, they're going to need longer periods of recovery in between sprints, in between sets, whatever it is. So what we've got here is he says here, work period one, the rest period is three plus. So, for example, you might do 10 reps on a heavy weight, but give yourself, that might only take 10, 20 seconds, but that's going to take two to three minutes recovery. So that's at least three times the amount of time it took you to do the work in the first place. With this high intensity nature of trying to train type two muscle fibers, you're going to get muscle fiber damage. OK, um, and, you know, that's the point that really that's the point of the training. The point is to damage the muscle fibers, con uh, consume your protein following that so that those muscle fibers repair stronger, thicker, more powerful in the following days. But as a result of that, it's often recommended that these same muscle fibers are not worked within four to ten days. So what we mean by that is if you do, let's say, a chest day at the gym on a Monday and you do heavy weights, and you follow the one to three work to rest ratio and all that jazz, you shouldn't then do another chest day for a minimum of four days, which is why we often see elite athletes rotating body parts. They'll have a chest day, a legs day, a back day, an arm day, you know, a recovery day. And by the time they've done that, it's probably okay to come back to the chest again. If you've had a really, really heavy session, you know, sometimes they recommend up to 10 days recovery, depending on how hard you've hit those individual muscle groups. So that's how the muscle fiber type can, uh, sorry, that's how muscle fiber types are used in certain activities, but also how you've got to train them carefully and you've got to give them the, uh, the right and correct work to rest ratio, work to relief ratio. Hope you found this video useful, folks.